Peter, and thanks very much to the Institute for this invitation to come and share some thoughts with you. Um, I remember some years ago reading a, an article, an interview with Mario Cuomo, who was then the governor of New York State, and he said when he told his teacher that he was going into politics, the father of Flynn, he took him aside and he said, let me give you a little bit of advice. He said, um, when you go into that game, he said, you'd be asked to do a lot of public speaking. But he said, just keep in mind one thing. He said, think of yourself as a corpse at an old Irish wake. He said, they need you there to have the get-together, but they sure don't expect you to say a great deal. <laughs> I wish we could say that in some way about our, our topic tonight, because religion, politics, conflict is such an enormous scope that it has been really difficult to see where can we um, focus in on so as to have a profitable and mutually enriching discussion. What I'd like to do is to approach this in two halves, as it were. First of all, to give the theory, as it were. And then in the second half that we have open discussion. And in that part, I'd like to focus in on some of the actual work we're doing, where that theory applies. We'll say the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the situation in Tunisia, the situation in Egypt in particular. I'm just thinking of two or any other areas you would like to focus on. It was about six years ago, I was invited by the New York Public Library to have a public debate with Sam Harris on his book, A Letter to the Christian Nation. Now, in that book, Harris explores what he claims to be the danger that religion now poses to modern societies. He argued that much of the violence in the world today comes directly from people willing to believe and to die for sacred religious texts. He was ad so adamant in that belief that as you are well aware, he shares with Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens, that science was the only way to truth, and that religions are equally deluded and destructive, that I find it quite impossible to have any sort of rational exchange with them. Now, I, I share this experience with you because you only have to take a quick glance at the headlines any day of the week to appreciate the enormous importance of the topic religion, politics, and conflict. And not only the enormous importance, but the urgent need to have an informed, rational, and I would say widespread debate on the interplay, real or perceived, between these three important aspects of human life. What's happening today in Tunisia, where I just returned from last week, or in Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Bahrain, Somalia, Nigeria, Sudan, Sri Lanka, Israel, Palestine, and dare I say, much nearer home on our own shores in Northern Ireland underscores the immediate relevance of our topic. The seriousness of the topic, I believe, was underlined by the Turkish President, Abdullah Gül, speaking at the Istanbul Forum at the beginning of October, when he warned that ethnic and sectarian identity politics that are based on shallow geographical interests will usher in a period of medieval darkness of the region. He was referring, of course, to the standoff between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the sectarian conflict that is being played out in the towns and streets of Syria and Iraq. It's a scenario, he claimed, 
that will lead to a clash within the civilization that will be more detrimental than a clash of civilizations. And this is a disaster scenario where everybody loses. The only alternative, Ull declared, was to transform their region into a space of peace, stability, and welfare by meeting along common values and interests. Now, it's been frequently argued, and especially by those who hold a totally secular worldview, that development and pluralism advanced in Europe only when, following years of religio-political conflict, the Westphalian Agreement removed religion from the international agenda, and the Enlightenment established a clear division between the realms of religious and political authority. In contrast, Muslim scholars often argue that in many Muslim societies, development and pluralism advanced furthest when religion and politics were deeply integrated, and that tyranny and injustice arose largely as a result of the sidelining and the subsequent exploiting of religion for social and political purposes. Now, I believe there is an element of truth in both these positions. But I fear the relationship between religion, politics, and conflict is much more complex than represented by either of these arguments. Religion has the potential to be a cause of conflict, and equally, it can be an important tool for the prevention, management, and resolution of conflict. It can be a powerful force for integration or a cause of segregation and marginalization of the other. This, I believe, is true regardless of the theological or ethnic differences that exist at the global, regional, and local levels. The bottom line is, I believe, that religion, for most believers, whether they're, whatever their particular faith tradition, embraces the whole of the human experience, and either consciously or unconsciously helps shape their human response to the moral, social, and political challenges they encounter in their daily lives. If religion could be confined to the sanctuary, confined to the performance of rituals within temples, synagogues, churches, and mosques, generations of believers in the former Soviet Union would and could have coexisted comfortably with the regimes that saw no place for religion in the public sphere but who, after failing to eradicate belief, were willing to tolerate it, its presence if it was practiced privately and with no claim to a public manifestation. Now, the question I wish to explore is whether religion can indeed be a causal factor of conflict. In his book, The Clash of Civilizations, Samuel Huntington's answer to this is a simple yes. He argued that in the post-Cold War era, culture and religious differences would replace ideology as the more probable cause of conflict. The old divisions of the first, second, and third worlds, which were drawn up along ideological lines, would give way, he claimed, to new civilizational differences that could prove to be even more menacing. Nationalism and communism were essentially artificially constructed belief systems, whereas culture, the defining factor in civilization, Huntington argues, is about identity itself. It shapes the basic perceptions that people have about life and their understanding of the relationships with God, with each other, with authority, and with the state. The differences between the major cultures 
are re-emerging, he claimed, as key players in reshaping the contemporary world, and therefore more profound than these created by the discarded ideologies of the 20th century. He accepts that people can and do redefine their identities, but his basic premises is that civilizations are nonetheless meaningful entities, and that while the lines between them are seldom sharp, they are real. This is particularly true, he believes, of religion, which he regards as possibly the most profound difference that can exist between people. Now, Huntington's second premises is that globalization created greater opportunity for interaction among these diverse civilizations, making people conscious of their differences and as a consequence, pe making people um, more anxious about where they fit in to the new global design. His conclusion is that the possibility of conflict, and especially along what he describes fault lines, where different civilizations meet and have to compete for resources and influence is greatly enhanced. Huntington, as you probably are well aware, gave particular attention to the role of Islam in the making of the new world order. He refutes the argument that the West does not have a problem with Islam itself, but only with violent ex Islamist extremists. Relationships between Islam and Christianity, he maintains, have often been stormy. Islam is the only civilization, he argued, that has twice threatened the survival of the West. The cause of what he sees as an ongoing pattern of conflict is deeper than any transitory phenomena and is rooted, he believes, in the nature of the two religions themselves. Christianity and Islam, the civilizations based on them as well, are missionary in nature. Both these religions aim to convert non-believers to their vision of the one true faith. From its origins, Huntington argues, Islam has expanded by conquest, and when the opportunity existed, Christianity did also. Now, in sharp contrast, to the Huntington theory that religion matters and that the American political scientist Ted Gore argues that the single factor explanations that focus on ancient hatreds or cultural difference should be avoided. He argues that the significance of these lies solely in the fact that they are invoked by contemporary ethno-political leaders seeking to mobilize support. For him, there is a clear causal link between grievance and rebellion. Discrimination and repression against national and minority peoples are a pervasive source of poverty and resentment and provide strong incentives for ethno-political mobilization, protest and rebellion. These identities, he claims, are nonetheless real and not only endure over time, but also provide the basis for mobilization and action to redress grievances and to protect self-interest. The, sali the salience at a given time depends upon a group's social and political circumstances. Treat a group differently by denial or privilege and its members become more self-conscious about their common bonds and interests. Minimize the difference and communal identification becomes less significant as a unifying principle. The greater the competition and equalities group in heterogeneous societies, he contends, the greater the salience of ethnic identities and the greater the likelihood of open conflict. When conflict erupts, opposing groups, he claims, become even more conscious of their differences and at the same time aware of the common interests of one group. 
So we see in very sharp contrast to Huntington, Gur claims grievance is the root, but sees that religion or ethnic identity can be a useful mobilizing factor in getting people to address those grievances. Very briefly moving on that, as I see, the time I've allocated is rapidly disappearing. Paul Collier, and some of you may know as the director or once director of the um, Development Economics Research Group at the World Bank, dismissed both these arguments. And from his studies, he said that the main cause of conflict is simply greed. Based on studies and research that he had done in some 160 countries and 78 civil wars between 1960 and 1999, he said the greed theory, which focused on a group's ability to finance rebellion and to benefit from it against the grievance theory um, or any sort of religious theory um, is far, far more significant. It is the presence of lootable commodities, large quantities of natural resources, he found, that provide the best opportunity for financial viability and increase the sustainability, therefore, of the risk of conflict. The fact that these commodities are tied to a single spot, a diamond mine, a coffee plantation, makes them an easier target for rebels to commandeer. It's the ability to seize, loot, and to export such resources, he believes, that is really the current cause of many of the conflicts that he has researched. Again, briefly looking at an alternative theory, and I'm hoping, trying to capture some of the complexity of the issue that we're looking at, we have, again, the American um, political scientist Jack Schneider, who really puts it in simple terms, the cause of conflict in the world today, mainly to a rush to democracy. His book, Voting to Violence, explains this, that based on the American foreign policy of the 90s, which was shaped by the belief that no two democracies have ever fought a war against each other, democracy was seen as the antidote to war and civil strife. To promote democracy was to promote peace. What the policy failed to recognize, Schneider argues, was the risks involved in the process itself. Consequently, he argues that the 90s turned out to be a decade of both democratization and chronic nationalist conflict. And his uh, um, argument goes on to say that the greatest risk is that we rush with the ballot box and we do not have in place the institutions that can guarantee fairness, equality, and justice for the citizens. So the change that is expected through the ballot box and through the um, implementation of democracy, he sees, is something that cannot be fulfilled in short time and therefore gives rise to further conflict or means that the old elites have given time to regroup and to seize power again. And I think we have seen examples of that very recently. Now, although both Gur and Schneider acknowledge there is a religious factor in many conflicts, like Collier, neither of them considered religion as a serious enough actor to merit particular interest in their research. Their paradigms reflect the reductionist approach to conflict that prevails within the social and political sciences. Reductionists <coughs> always seek the simplest explanation of conflict. As religion is considered to be a redundant factor in life, an epiphenomenon that is incapable of having its own independent impact on social and political life, it does not merit, therefore, to be taken seriously as a real cause of conflict. In sharp contrast, we saw Huntington 
overemphasizes the potential of religion to shape contemporary culture and therefore to be a, perma, a, a primal cause of conflict. In applying the creed, greed, and grievance theories to contemporary civil conflicts, it, becom it becomes clear, I believe, that no one theory in itself is capable of providing a convincing explanation for the root cause of these conflicts. Each theory provides, in my belief, an important insight, a piece of the jigsaw that needs to be kept in focus as we navigate the complexities of the causes and the interplay of motives that make so many of these contemporary conflicts appear to be intractable. Economic and political discrimination, injustice, scarce and unequal access to essential resources are all factors that make people more receptive to ethnic and nationalistic appeals. The promotion of democracy, power sharing and economic growth will undoubtedly help lessen the likelihood of ethnic or religious conflict in a multi-ethnic, religiously diverse society. But these factors in themselves are insufficient enough, I believe, to guarantee against the kind of violence that is motivated solely by religious conviction that justifies killing in the name of a higher cause. The history of our religious traditions dominates or demonstrates that religion has always had the propensity for violence regardless of the social and political conditions of its devotees. But given the secular reductionist approach to the understanding of the causes of conflict and the ambivalence past and present to the world's different religious traditions towards the use of violence, it should come no surprise to us in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 we witnessed a coming together of liberal commentators, religious leaders, and politicians, all of whom were keen to exonerate religion from any form of responsibility for what had happened. At the time, it reminded me of the response to the first outbreak of sectarian violence in Northern Ireland. In 1970, church leaders were united in declaring that whatever might be the causes of the sectarian violence in part of this island, religion was not to blame. Liberal and academic opinion endorsed this view, pointing to Britain's colonial record in Ireland as the real explanation for the conflict between Catholics and Protestants. It took several hundred deaths before an inter-church working party finally acknowledged that religious identity and centuries of unchallenged sectarianism were, and for that matter still are, a real issue on this island. The liberal endorsement of the claim that faith is not to blame for any of the current day atrocities we see around the world stems from a, a deeply ingrained conviction that religion by itself is incapable of sharing, of inspiring rather, such actions. To focus us on religious motives, many political and social scientists would argue, is to risk masking over the real cause, which they would claim is more likely to be a mix of grievance and political ambition. The eagerness of religious leaders to endorse this and to repudiate and disclaim atrocities committed by the co-religionists is no doubt prompted by an understandable fear that violence linked to religion portrays a distorted image of the faith. The scapegoating of the perpetrators by labeling them as political criminals or misguided fanatics has become a common mechanism used by leaders of all faiths 
to protect what they believe to be the purity and integrity of the religion. The denial that there is a problem, whether it be consciously or unconsciously, is itself part of the problem. It allows religious leaders to circumvent the fact that all the main faith traditions have a violent, bloody record that needs to be acknowledged and addressed to avoid the risk of repetition. Today's faith identity-linked violent activist, activists have numerous exemplars within their own faith traditions to provide them the kind of religious sanction the need to justify their own use of violence. Reactions that either over-exaggerate or underplay the role of religion in conflict fail to do justice to the complexity of faith-associated violence. Most of the soundbite analysis given immediately after 9-11 proved to be equally far too one-dimensional. Claims that we were witnessing a rejection of modernity and the global and globalization or the pursuit of a kind of ap apocalyptic nihilism are partial truths that fail to address the core of the problem, which I believe lies within how faith-inspired militants perceive their religion and in particular how they understand the process of revelation that lies behind their sacred texts. Whatever their particular religious beliefs and customs, today's faith-inspired violent activists hold in common the belief that their scriptural or foundational texts were dictated verbatim by a divine authority and as such are beyond interpretation. The word as it is written must be obeyed. The fact that they are always selective in their choice of texts and tend to focus on passages that underscore the ex their exclusive claim to truth and the superiority over others while ignoring passages that stress the universal nature of the divine love and compassion seems not to perturb them. The social and political milieu can and often does provide the trigger for sectarian violence. But these are not necessarily the fundamental causes for religious intolerance and violence in the world today. The contemporary mindset of the political and academic world of conflict analysis and resolution sees no role for religion because it has been shaped by the belief that the 17th century Treaty of Westphalia did and combined with the Enlightenment had banished religion once and for all from the international agenda. The secularization thesis that dominates today's political thinking is based on the premises that the decline in religion is an inevitable process. The Enlightenment secularist argues challenge the old religious certainties, making science the new paradigm of understanding the world. Religion, they conceded, lingers on as a com comforting myth, providing support in times of personal crisis. But in effect, they argue, it is relegated to the main from the mainstream to the backwaters, and it has ceased to have an impact on the social, political, and um, modern life of society. I was going to illustrate this on how um, thinkers like Marx, Freud, and Durkheim had actually influenced this way of thinking, and how it impacts, I think, on a lot of approaches to conflict resolution and peace process, but time-wise, I think I have to cut short. And I'd just like to move on to make the point that Westphalia may have succeeded in putting an end to the pitch battles over beliefs that had marred interstate relationships in Europe for most of the century, the 17th century. But the claim that it removed once and for all the influence of religion from international politics I believe is much more questionable. It could be argued that by domesticating 
or nationalizing belief, the motto being that the faith of the ruler was the faith of the realm or the state, Westphalia, in fact, turned religion into a powerful social agent that was used to enforce cultural identity of the colonizers as the European princes and governments expanded to rule to embrace the countries of Africa and Asia. Sinhalese Buddhists in Sri Lanka, the BJP party, Hindu Nationalist Party in India, argue that the British colonial policies that favored one group over another, one faith group over another, a practice aimed at restricting religious hegemony that they enjoyed prior to colonization, ultimately sowed the seeds of their present conflicts. And I believe there is a big element of truth in their arguments. The impact of the Enlightenment may also have been over-exaggerated, in the sense that the secular argument seems to confuse religious practice with faith in an age when people are no longer obliged to conform to the cultural norms and expectations of society. The phenomenon of believing without feeling a need to belong to a community or to practice a particular faith makes it more difficult for social sciences to evaluate the real impact of religion on community or tribal life. To quote Alan Aldridge, the author of Religion in the Contemporary World, a sociological introduction, latent religiosity survives as a resource to be mobilized at times of crisis in the lives of individual or the history of the society. Again, if time allowed, we could look at a number of modern day examples, I think, that illustrates this. But I'd just like to focus on one. In the NATO, in the conflict that led NATO's intervention in Kosovo, the Serb forces were deliberately targeting, targeting Islamic religious institutions. It's estimated that 218 mosques and homes of, and the homes of two, 302 imams, as well as several Islamic libraries and archives, were destroyed. Two of the main protagonists in those wars, Maladic and Karadic, both of whom were hailed before the International Tribunal in The Hague, were honored by the Orthodox hierarchy as examples of those who had cho chosen to follow, and I quote, the thorny path of Christ. Karadic was decorated by the Greek Orthodox Church as one of the most prominent sons of our Lord Jesus Christ working for peace. High-ranking officials in the Orthodox churches exalted on several occasions Arkan, another leader who was responsible for some of the worst atrocities in the Balkan conflict. Given then that religion can be or has the potential in itself to be a cause of conflict, can it be then also a tool for peace or conflict resolution? I think a starting point in this is that we have to acknowledge if we're involving ourselves in civil strife that has an ethnic or sectarian dimension, that theological differences are so rootly, are so deeply rooted that I would say we have to acknowledge that most of these are irreconcilable. To think that one can reconcile Shia dogma with Sunni dogma, even though in practice one would not recognize the differences, I think would be a fundable, fundamental mistake, as it would be to think that we can reconcile Protestant dogma with Catholic dogma. There can be overlaps, there can be common areas where we can share together, but I think we have acknowledged the fact 
that these exist or these differences exist and are likely to persist. And what we have to learn to do is to coexist, to live with our differences rather than to um, gloss over them or to think that we can fill in the gaps. My own experience of living in a room in Lisbon where I studied philosophy in the mid-60s with a massive crack in my wall which was caused by the earthquake in 1755 but which for two whole centuries the owners or the people responsible for the college had the sense not to try to patch up taught me a lesson that we have to live with the cracks in life that any attempt to paper over that or to repair it would have resulted in probably a bigger crack later. Some things are so foundational, and I think that is where the whole field of dogma exists. So the challenge, I would say, is to learn to coexist, to live with our differences, and not to see the other the person who shares different beliefs or values as a threat or a competitor. And to do this calls for a profound change in our understanding of ourself and those who are different to us. It calls for a mindset shift. We need to learn to think differently about the other and to actively promote a climate that allows for a real interaction and the development of a genuine respect for the differences in belief and practice. We need to move beyond sectarianism that can be ingrained within our religious communities. Some of you may be familiar with the Irish School of Ecumenics report, Moving Beyond Sectarianism, published in 2001, which describes the pervasiveness of sectarianism at every level of Northern Ireland society. It underlines the need to think about sectarianism as a systemic as well as a personal problem. Sectarianism, the authors write, has become a system so efficient that it can take our sane and rational responses to a situation which it has generated and use them to further deepen sectarianism. The example given is how people have responded to the violence over the years. The tendency has to be moved from mixed residential areas to live exclusively among their own. The authors recognize that this is a perfectly understandable and blameless response, but the unfortunate effect they claim is to reinforce sectarianism still further. What applied in Northern Ireland is still applicable, I think, in many parts of the world today facing strife. People find the approach to sectarianism by drawing lines between themselves and others. And because they always can find people whose actions are worse than their own, they can point to them as the real problem. The consequences of the dynamics of systemic sectarianism, this report claims, is that no one is ever responsible. The buck never stops passing. Sectarianism can also feed what the authors called religiously motivated boundary maintenance. Now, I think this is a real problem, and I believe and open for discussion that may be still very much an ongoing problem in parts of Ireland and Northern Ireland in particular, but it's certainly a problem in the area of the world in which I work. It can become so systemic that we don't recognize that we are actually a victim of it. But a sectarian mindset is not the monopoly of the street or the disadvantaged neighborhoods. It's also pervasive in the highest level of religious leadership. 
commenting on a meeting of more than 2,000 religious le leaders that was held in the United Nations in New York in the year, just the beginning of the millennium. The former chief rabbi of Great Britain, Jonathan Sachs, says he found it easy to understand why religion is often a cause of conflict as it's, it is of conciliation. He criticized his fellow participants for their failure to rise above the narrow loyalties of faith. The peace spoken of was too often peace on our terms. The general message he wrote was, our faith speaks of peace, our holy texts praise peace. Therefore, it is only the world shared, it, if only the world shared our faith and our texts, we would have peace. John Stuart Mill's arguments that diversity should be nurtured and not merely endured on the ground of it leading to truth and human progress appear to have been overshadowed by the climate of theo theological particularism. The belief that one group has exclusive possession of the truth, knowledge and goodness that are universally applicable that still shapes the outlook, I believe, of many religious leaders today. And I believe that is one of the biggest problems that we are encountering. But way back in 1864, Pius IX published the Syllabus of Errors in which he condemned the proposition, every man is free to embrace or to profess the religion which, by light of reason, he believes to be true. A hundred years later, John the Twenty-Third published an encyclical letter, Peace on Earth, in which he declared that the belief that every human being has the right to honor God according to the dictates of an upright conscience, and therefore the right to profess his religion in private and in public. His argument in the letter is based solely on the nature of the human person, and on his right to seek truth by free inquiry. To obey conscience, he maintains, is to obey God. The Second Vatican Council, we know, endorsed this in the, the Declaration on Religious Liberty, which said that reason and free will, our people are morally obliged to seek truth by these means. I'm very conscious that I have spent much more time on the theoretical arguments I wanted to put forward and, and therefore cutting down on the opportunity we will have to really look at these, their application of these in practical terms. I'd just like to conclude with one point. Where do we go from here? If we are all running the risk of being victims of that systemic sectarianism that becomes part of our human condition. How do we move um, to engage in a way that um, can, can promote a world in which we can actually learn to live with the cracks, the realities of the life we have inherited, and to understand what can be healed, what can be reconciled, and what we have to coexist with. I found the thinking of the Catholic existentialist philosopher, Gabriel Marcel, very helpful in this. His argument was basically that if you have religious conviction, it should be so profound that we understand the right of another person to live by the conscience. And that's, it's not a question of just tolerating the presence of someone who is different. Because remember, the whole Aquinas thinking about tolerance was formulated in a negative way. It was seen really, tolerance was always seen as the lesser of two evils. In an ideal world, you wouldn't have people who thought differently or acted differently for me. But we're not living in an ideal world. I can't eliminate them because I'm forbidden to do so, so I tolerate them. 
Now, Marcel takes that and says, no, we've got to move beyond tolerance. That if we truly respect our own beliefs, and our own beliefs are rooted in a conscientious awareness, a conscientious decision, we will respect, we will recognize and respect that in the other. And we will be proactive in promoting their right to be different from ourselves. Peter, I'd like to finish there because I'm sure there are lots of issues that people might like to discuss further. And again, um, we might like to look at it in a much more practical way than the theoretical way that I've approached it to, to now. Thank you.